taking your time to being here with me tonight. Um, and also, welcome to the people on the stream. This talk is about the Miwa Anker lock. Uh, I have one of these locks in my collection. I'm a bit of a lock collector. I used to be uh, chairman of Tool as well. And of course, I'm a hacker, like most of you. And I like to figure out how stuff works. And I thought a few years ago already, how does this uh, specific lock work? Because it's quite special in that it uses magnets. So I set up on a trip on figuring out about this particular lock. And this talk, the next 50 minutes, I will tell you about what I've tried to do with the lock, where I failed, what not many people will tell you nowadays when we all have Instagram, but I will tell you all the failures and all the successes as well. I probably don't have enough time to have, a real, uh, to have questions in between. If you have any questions, maybe we have some time at the end, or otherwise you can find me outside after the talk. So I have this background in tool, uh, and I also have to say I'm writing a book together with a few friends about uh, Locksport. So this cylinder, the Anker 3800 or Miwa 3800, it originated, was invented in Japan as Miwa. It is sold in the Netherlands as Anker. This is a, a view from the inside, and you see that this lock has uh, four pins, which you will find in many regular locks that you will find on the door, but also here, Above the pins, we have sliders with magnets in them, and that makes this a special kind of cylinder. Now here you see the key, and on the bottom of the key, there are these uh, indents, the, the bitting of the key, and you can see that they match four, the four pins that are inside the cylinder. So, uh, and on the other side of the key, we see uh, eight black squares, those are four sets of two magnets. And those are samarium cobalt magnets, and they can also be fakes. So some of these black blobs are magnets, and some of them are fakes. And these magnets make tiny little sliders in the cylinder move, uh, and they need to move to the correct spot to open. Right, so here again, you see a, a blown up version where you can clearly see that the uh, what did I do? The wrong button. Uh, where you can see that the sliders go from left to right within the plug, and they are operated by the magnets that you can see here in the key. And on the bottom, these pins are operated. Now the pins, I'm not really going into lock picking. Um, you can go to other talks or to the visit the tool village here at the campsite. But for lock picking, um, or for the, the pins, they need to be aligned at the shear line. So the length of the, the red pins need to match the cuts and the key. And when they are all perfectly aligned, the uh, plug is free to rotate. Well, that's not the interesting part. The interesting part is those magnets. So we have here the four sliders uh, that can slide. Uh, in this orientation, they slide up and down. And uh, so you see there's uh, four sets of two magnets and the key, that uh, one set per slider. Um, now, I then did some photoshopping to create this wonderful slide, so I think this is my Photoshop achievement unlocked, although it's a bit crappy, but I'm not a designer, I'm a hacker. On the left, you see the closed lock, and you can see that the pin is not at the shear line, and also you see this um, yellow um, uh, slider, it, it protrudes into the uh, edge of the cylinder, so that's why it won't open, and there's a little spring on top, um, and this uh, green and red thing, that's the magnet. And on the right, you see it with the correct key inserted. So the key pushes the pin to the correct depth, and also the magnets in the key uh, will um, interact with the magnets in the slider, moving it away to the right, freeing up the plug. So that's basically how it works. And here you see that in this... Uh, so I said there are pairs of magnets, but in this case, there's only a magnet on one side of the key, and that is actually quite normal. Um, here you see a key with a piece of uh, magnetic uh, paper on top of it, and you can clearly make out that there is magnets in there. And I can even also tell 
that the bottom two, they are either facing north up or south up, and the upper two, they are uh, facing left or right. So there are different orientations of magnets, and that is what creates the, the key in this, the, the, the code in this key. And of course, you need at least one magnet per slider to operate the slider. If you would use an incorrect key, then maybe the bitting is incorrect, which means that some pins are sticking out, or you have the incorrect magnets, which means that the sliders are sticking out. So they all need to be correct for everything to align within the plug and the plug to rotate. Right, so this is uh, the theory, um, how this lock works. So I hope that is all clear. Now let's look at defeating this lock. So what about picking? Can we pick this cylinder? Well, the four pins that are in there, they are just four pins. And you could lock pick them with uh, regular picking techniques. And actually, there's only four of them, whereas most common locks have five. So that should be easier. But then there's also these magnets. Now, these magnets can also be, be manipulated if you take a piece of metal and uh, glue a small magnet on the end of it. You can insert it in the lock and wiggle it and manipulate these sliders. And the sliders will move inside of the cylinder, and you can also use audio magnification to make it easier to, to figure out what is happening and then open this lock. This is not easy. When I started my research, which was already quite a few years ago, uh, I had not seen anybody open this cylinder before. But um, later on, I found, well, here's at least four videos on YouTube where you can figure out, uh, well, where you can see this lock actually being picked by hand. But there's only a few videos, so that already tells you that this is a very hard lock to lock pick because of those magnets. And, and uh, um, the oldest videos are about uh, two years old that I found. So what I did was I took an old cylinder and I um, uh, made a uh, test cylinder out of it. So in one side, I only kept the pins and the other side, I only kept the magnetic sliders to, uh, to work with this. And my first thought was, can we duplicate the key? Because you cannot just duplicate such a key. You need uh, to call to the factory to get it duplicated. And you need to have a certificate. But if you have a key, can you make a copy? And of course, you need to uh, read out the magnets. So we need some kind of device to measure the magnetic field. Now, I'm uh, quite an old hacker, so uh, I like to do electronics, real old stuff electronics. I have a talk about the Gigatron tomorrow night, but that's a different story. So I made this, uh, I, I found this on the internet, and I made a magnetometer. So here's a device that you can use to measure magnetic fields. And as you can see here, I can read out the magnets. And you will see that some magnets are orientated left to right, and some of them are, no, are up down. Uh, oh, that's not true. In this particular uh, key, they are all left to right oriented. And you can al also see that for, for each pair, there's only one that is an actual magnet. The other one is fake. OK, reading the uh, magnets, done. My electronic badge is in the pocket. But now I need to create a duplicate key with these magnets. Now, the blank keys are, cannot be obtained. Um, so I cannot start off with a blank key and, and put in magnets and, and make it fit. The magnets are, are made by a factory in, I believe it is in France or Spain or somewhere. And uh, the only uh, company in the Netherlands that has these is the Anchor Factory itself. And they won't just give you uh, a key. Maybe if you're very good in social engineering. But anyway, I thought I'd make a um, magnet setup key. So I take an existing key, try to take out all the existing magnets, so I have holes in which I can put my own magnets. So I use my Dremel, and uh, I also took away the bitting. And my idea was this key is used to set the magnets, and then I can use this slit in between to pick the pins. Because, uh, yeah, I, ca I cannot form an existing key, I cannot make another bitting of another key. So I thought, well, let's make a key with the magnets and do picking. Well, that was also an epic fail, because there, there's so little room inside this cylinder that I just could not put my pick in the, uh, t in the lock 
and uh, yeah, not disturb pins that I did not want to move. So that was a fail. But nevertheless, I proceeded. I, I bought some 2x2x2 two by two by two millimeter magnets. Um, and um, yeah, I tried to make the setup key anyway, because I wanted to do, yeah, I still was trying to learn more stuff. But this just didn't work. I'm not very good at metal work, uh, it appears. And it was too steep a learning curve for me. I didn't have the uh, right equipment. So the setup key thing was going nowhere. It failed. So I thought, how else? Well, let's, let's forget about these magnets for a while. Uh, let's suppose that we can create a key with the correct magnets. Let's suppose I find somebody who can do the metal stuff and create this empty key for me. If I have it, what do I do with the bitting? How do I copy the bitting? Well, I also uh, do have uh, some uh, equipment to make uh, copies of keys by using molding. So you take some uh, putty, you put in the key, it makes uh, uh, you, you get a mold, you put, pour in molten metal, and you have a copy. Here you see a mold I made of an existing key. So now my idea was, if I have a setup key with the correct magnets, I need to put in this bitting that you see here. And this is how I did it. So the setup key I combine with the mold of the key I want to copy. I pour in metal, and this is the result. Does it work? Yay, achievement unlocked. Of course, this is the cylinder that only has the pins and not the sliders, because I didn't succeed in making the setup key. But this proves that if I have a setup key, I could copy the bitting. So to duplicate a key, we could make a skeleton key from the existing key. Uh, but that's quite frustrating. Also. Even if I could get this empty key with the holes to put the magnets in, the magnets that I bought are 2x2x2 two by two by two millimeters, and the key is only 2.1 millimeters thick. If you have only 0.1 millimeter left, you, yeah, it becomes really horrible to work with. And this was the state of affairs in, at LogCon 2019, just before COVID, and I thought, well, the only solution I see to get it to, get to advance is to do 3D printing. But I didn't have a 3D printer. And um, yeah, I, I left the project. Uh, I, I abandoned it. But then came COVID. And I had time. And I also had a little bit of money left to buy myself a uh, present, which is this uh, Creality Halot uh, printer. This is a resin printer because I thought, because of the really tight tolerances, I needed a very uh, a printer that could, could make really minute details. I bought this printer. And I thought, and I was still somehow stupid of me in the mode of I need to get that setup key. So what I did was I made a uh, setup key with the slit to do the picking, which I already knew didn't work anyway. And I, uh, but this was fun because I needed to learn about uh, open SCAT uh, and CAT design. So again, achievement unlocked. I was able to create a 3D model of this key. And this has the slit to, uh, to allow for picking. And this is actually uh, maybe the, the second or third thing I printed on this printer. So I was really chuffed. Uh, it did need a little bit of filing to make it really fit, because the measurements were a little bit, little bit off. But as you can see, the magnets did fit. It didn't break. And best of all, it does work on my cylinder that has just the magnets. So the proof of concept is I can make this key. Still a tiny problem of the slit where I cannot put in my picking tool without uh, yeah, uh, doing anything. But I f first, I, uh, I fixed my model to make, it more, uh, to make it fit better. So this is a, a, a somewhat later key, and this fits right away after printing. Uh, but I still had that problem. In the meantime, I had learned from those YouTube videos, which were made uh, after I picked this project up again in COVID, um, I found out that the pins are first to bind. In many locks, with different rows of pins of different elements, you need to pick one row first, then the lock will rotate slightly, and then you need to pick another one, uh, the, the second row of pins. Now, in this particular lock, you need to pick the pins first, then it will rotate a little bit, and then you need to uh, put the sliders in the correct position. So I can actually, by uh, applying tension in the middle of the lock and using a, a picking tool, 
I can pick the four pins. And when the four pins have been picked, I can use the setup key that I made by copying the magnets from the original key. I can insert it and keep the tensioner in place, and that would open the lock. And I tried this, and I picked the lock, and actually it was much harder than I had anticipated. But achievement unlocked, I did open it, but this is not really something that a um, non-professional lock picker would easily do. Um, also the pins in this lock ha ha are anti-picking pins, which makes it more difficult to pick them. Um, yeah, but as I said, um, oh, so the attack factor that we have up till now is if I have access to a key, even temporary, I can read out the magnets, I can create a setup key, I can pick the pins and open it. But of course, why am I not just 3D printing the bitting? I was really stuck on my original train of thoughts of do continuing what I was doing. But of course, you can just print the bitting. Uh, I mean, that's no, no biggie. So I uh, updated my model, and you can now uh, create uh, bitting in there as well. And uh, yeah, you can just type in another code, and as you can see, it will change. There's another bitting. So you can just type in the number of the, of the, yeah, the code of the bidding that you want to have, and uh, you create a key. So with that, here's a, such a key that has been printed, and it does work on both sides. So now we can actually create a copy. Of course, you also need to know what the bidding is, but there's only four pins, and the depth of these pins, there's only four possibilities. So that's not much. In many locks, you will have seven or maybe nine possibilities, and then you really have to measure quite well to see which, uh, which depth it is. But in the anchor, it's only four. And if you've been doing this for a bit of time, you can do this with a naked eye. If you give me an anchor key, I can see with a naked eye what the depth are. So I can put that in my uh, open SCAD, print a key, and have a duplicate. So that's interesting. The uh, problem is a little bit that the keys are very brittle. Um, I once dropped a key from this height and it broke in two. Uh, and also, you have to be careful inside of the lock. Uh, so, so I also did have a key break inside of the lock, and it gave me a very hard time getting that key out again. So that's also why if you do these kinds of experiments, you do them on your own cylinders that you don't use in a door or somewhere where you rely upon them. So the keys are brittle, so what to do about that? I thought about this, and I thought, well, if we make the magnets smaller, there is more uh, surrounding material making the key uh, more sturdy. So I did find some one by one by one millimeter magnets. Now, they are so incredibly small that if you put, put them in tweezers and you move them around, they will, they will already flip. It's, uh, I gave up. And then uh, I talked to a colleague of mine at work uh, about this uh, hobby project, and he said, um, well, why not use disk uh, magnets? And he actually uh, already started on uh, printing on his printer a key, and he does not have a resin printer, but a uh, filament printer. And uh, as you can see here on the bottom, this is a key where the magnets are cylindrical. This means that some cylinders, uh, some magnets need to go flat, and some magnets need to be uh, going deep inside of the key. But of course, if you print a key on a per-use basis, you can print it any way you like. So you just print it so it fits the correct magnets. And what's even better, you can leave out the holes where you don't need a magnet, where, the, where we have these fake magnets, which will also uh, strengthen the key more. And uh, I was worried about the filament printer not being able to make the key uh, with such tolerances that it would work, but actually it does work flawlessly. So that's about key copying. But another kind of attack is where you want to ha gain en entry to a, uh, or gain entry, open a lock where you do not have the original key. So this is not about key copying, but about uh, opening the lock, decoding, picking, whatever. Now here again, some wonderful photoshopping, and you see that the, um, the uh, key on the right has a, a magnet with north facing up, and this matches for this um, slider a magnet where north is facing right. 
and it always has to be the same. If you if you have this key, this um, type of magnet in the key, you know what needs to be in the um, slider to make it move in the correct direction. And for each of these magnets, there's five possibilities: north up, north down, north to the left, north to the right, or no magnet at all. So here you see the arrows represent the direction the sliders need to move. So two of them move right and two of them move left. And it's the same for every uh, cylinder. And here you see the uh, magnets that I've uh, read out. And uh, I then know if I see this key, I know already that the lock must contain these sliders. Because if this key is inserted in this specific lock, I know that it's the only way that the sliders will be um, moved to the correct position. So knowing the magnets in the key, with that I will learn what the magnets are in the cylinder. But it's also the uh, other way around. If I know what is in the cylinder, I then know what is in the key. So I wanted to read out the magnets in the cylinder. So I use my uh, wonderful magnetometer, uh, try to read out the magnets, uh, but yeah, it doesn't fit. The sensor is too big. As I said, these, this lock is, has a weird shape, and there's really not a lot of space. So this was a fail. And um, I looked for smaller ones, smaller hole sensors, and I found this in a SOT23 package, which is rather small. I bought a few of them. And uh, then I needed to put this on something to insert into the cylinder. I then uh, tried the KiCad to design a little PCB, just a flat piece of PCB that goes inside of the cylinder. And uh, I bought some uh, 0.4 millimeter flexible PCB. And I was told by somebody, you can, uh, so that's a KiCad achievement. And somebody told me, if you print your KiCad design with a laser printer on inkjet paper, and then use a, an iron, you can transfer it to the PCB and etch it. Well, for me, this uh, failed uh, horribly. I don't know what I did wrong. Maybe some of you know. Come see me after the talk. But I reverted to uh, really old school PCB making, which I've already done years and years ago. It's just using a Sharpie and uh, drawing on it and uh, making it. So uh, that was uh, achieved, but uh, still failed because it didn't fit. Here you see on the bottom left, you see that the um, sensor is on top of the PCB. And together with the PCB, it was still too high. So the solution was to put this, the whole sensor at the end of the uh, PCB and glue it on. And for that, I needed to uh, extend the wires. So I used 0.1 millimeter wires and soldered them on. And this was the most hard thing of the whole project. It was really frustrating. But it did work in the end. So it was on. It was working. I used it with my magnetometer, and it failed because it uses different voltage levels than the other whole sensor. So I needed to fix my electronics, but uh, I thought, well, let's learn some more stuff. Let's do something with an Arduino. I mean, it's totally overkill for reading out the whole sensor, but it's fun anyway. So here you can see the uh, device in action. So I can insert it. I have to wiggle it a little bit uh, in case the magnet is going left and right. Um, but you see, I can actually read out the, the magnets that are in the, the cylinder. And what's interesting is that this lock has quite a few magnets, but we'll get to that later. And uh, since I was doing this anyway, I thought, well, let's make it more beautiful. So I ordered this uh, LCD touchscreen, and uh, I also programmed in that you can, uh, that it will translate from the magnets in the key to the cylinder, and vice versa. It has now an analog mode and a digital mode to show what the magnet uh, magnetization is. There's an SD card in there, so you can save the current uh, readout to the SD card. And here you see me reading out a uh, specific cylinder. And you see it will translate automatically. If the cylinder in this position has this kind of magnet, then the key must have this other magnet in that place. And now if I read out the original key, I should get what is depicted on the left. Works, great. So I can now read out the magnets 
in a cylinder. So the attack factor is if I have temporary access to a cylinder, but not the key, I can read out the magnets and I can determine what magnets need to be in the key. But I don't have the bittings. So we still, I can make a setup key, but I still need to do the lock picking for the four pins for one time opening with a lot of effort. Or I could make uh, all possibilities because it's only four pins with four possibilities. If I make, uh, if I spend uh, uh, a few days and make 256 keys, I could try them out and one of them will fit. So that's, yeah, do we have an alternative instead of picking or creating 256 keys? So one of the ways that you can also open a lock uh, one time is using bumping. So I won't just explain everything with bumping, but the idea very shortly is that you apply a lot of force to the pins, that, transfer, that uh, force is um, uh, moved over to the other pins on, the, on top, they will uh, separate for a short moment of time, and in that time you can open the lock. Can we do bumping? Now that's quite hard as well, because for bumping you need a bump key. A bump key is a key where, uh, as you can see here in the, in the movie, uh, the, the key is cut to the deepest most position everywhere. But for this I need an existing key. And I also need to have the correct magnets in there. Um, so I could print a... Uh, uh, so um, yeah, I, I cannot get a blank key from the factory, because they won't give it to, uh, to anybody. But I can print a key. Well, the resin printed key is much too brittle, so I, if I, if I yeah, smash it, it will break. But fortunately, the uh, PETG key is strong enough. So this is PETG on the filament printer. So I have the correct magnets that I've read out. I use a bump uh, hammer. And of course, I show you the video where this works in one hit. Normally, it would take maybe five, six, seven, eight hits. Uh, to open it. it. It does require a bit of practice to be able to do this. But it works, and it did, did work repeatedly. So the key was not, um, it was still operational uh, for another bump after I did this bump. So that's nice. That gives me uh, the possibility to do a one-time opening uh, if I don't have the key. There's another way of finding the bitting, which is impressioning. That's also a very interesting topic that you could also talk about for 50 minutes. Uh, instead, maybe you can watch this video by uh, Jos Weijers. He did a great job on uh, attacking master key systems, uh, how to do that with impressioning. With impressioning, you start with a key that has uh, all the pins in the top, uh, maximum uh, level. You wiggle it in the lock, and it, the, 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 the pins will make tiny marks on the key. So you need to have a key that has rather soft material, like brass, not steel and you get tiny marks, you need a magnifying glass to see them, and where you see a mark, you need to file away a little bit of material until it, yeah, it fits. Because if you, if you file it to the correct depth, it will no longer mark. And here you see a lock, so, so there's a, here's a key, a dimple lock key that I impressioned, and you see it looks a bit weird because I filed straight over the key, but it doesn't matter as long as the place where the pin drops goes to the correct spot, that is fine. Now, can we do this for um, the anchor, well, not with our 3D printed keys. I mean, that material is not suited for doing impressioning. You need to apply quite a lot of force, and these pins need to mark the key. So we need a brass setup key, and we don't have those. A uh, setup key, a brass impressioning key. Well, I was talking to my colleague, Guido, about this project, and he said, oh, but I have a CNC machine. Maybe I can do something for you. So. Actually, he did a, a, an aluminum key for me as well. So he, and, and from that one, he took some pictures. So here you see that he's creating from a piece of uh, aluminum, a, uh, or aluminium, I should say, probably here, uh, made a key with the spaces to put the magnets in. And you can make this a bump key, or an impressioning key. And here's the impressioning key. So this was made out of brass. And on the bottom left, you can see uh, that under the right lighting, you can see the marks that the pins make on the key, and there you file away a little bit, and you try again. So this is not something that you can do in a few minutes. It takes, uh, yeah, several steps, um, and, uh, and quite a bit of time. And, yeah, did I achieve it? Yeah, I achieved impressing a, a, a key to make it fit, but I feel I also kind of failed, because this was very hard. I mean, I've done impressioning in the past with regular locks, 
and the lock you saw before. That is way more easy than with this particular lock. I'm not really sure what is the reason for that. Um, maybe it's also the material used, but I found it very hard and it's mm, not really a, yeah, a real life scenario, I would say. But still, we now have an attack vector when you have access to the cylinder, but you don't have a key. We can read out the magnets, and we could create a, a setup key uh, uh, with the deepest cuts to do a one-time bump. So you have opened it, but you don't know what the combination is. Or if you're very experienced, you might be able to do impressioning, which will take quite a bit of time. But then you end up with knowing the correct bitting. So you have an actual key for a cylinder that you have not seen the key uh, for before. Now let's talk about something uh, else, which is master keying. Because the Anker lock is a high security lock. It was invented in the uh, 1980s, I think I already mentioned. It was patented uh, in the early 80s. Uh, the patent has been, um, is no longer valid uh, by a long time. But they are used in, in high security uh, environments like uh, hospitals and, su and, and such. And in those environments, uh, they use master keying a lot. And a very short introduction to master keying. Master keying is where you have cylinders that, have, that each have their own key. So you have a key that works on your door in your office, but you also have a key uh, that works on all the doors on your floor or all the doors in your building or all the doors on the site. But let's keep it simple and only look at, uh, I'll, I'll show you an example with just two locks with two individual keys and one third key that opens both of them. How does that work in a traditional system? This is a traditional pin tumbler lock, master key. So on the left is Alice's lock, and on the right is Andy's lock. And here you see Alice's key. Alice's key uh, will open Alice's lock. Why? Because all the pins are, uh, oops, all the pins are here straight at the shear line. So that works, but it doesn't work on Andy's lock because as you can see, some pins are still blocking. So Alice's key only works on Alice's lock. Andy has a different key. And here you can see that Andy's key will work on Andy's lock, but it does not work on Alice's lock. So far, so good. And now comes the special key, the uh, master key or grand master key or submaster key or whatever you call it. And this key will open, as you can see, both locks. And you've also seen that the way they do this is by uh, cutting up the pins once more. So you have two possible depths that will open, uh, that will set that pin to the correct position. Well, there's two correct positions. And what's also interesting to note is that the uh, master key that you see here on top, uh, in this case, in this example, differs in two spots. And the master key always has more material on it than the individual user keys. And uh, if you're a real hacker, uh, you will probably figure this out. But the reason is that if you have the user key, you must not be able to create a master key by just filing away a little bit of stuff. So you can create an individual key by the master key by filing, but that's not really a, an attack factor. Now, if you translate that to uh, Anker, then you will see that also there we have master keying in the pins. So the, the, the pin in, in red is, a, is actually, it's, it's now lying flat, but it is a really thin um, spacer. And on the right, middle right, you see the three different spacers that exist uh, with a depth of one, two, or three. And you also see the pins with depth one, two, three, four. So with these, you can make all kinds of combinations. So for this, these pins in this uh, cylinder is part of a master key system. And there is two bittings that will uh, match to open the lock. So my naive thought uh, when I started this was to think, well, if I have a, an existing key, so let's get back to the scenario where we do have a key for a cylinder, and we know it's master keyed, and I have this key, I know it's a user key, so I don't have much access, um, then, well, this must be the correct position also for the um, master key, because otherwise the, I could file away stuff to get to the master key, which is against our rule. And this pin, well, the master key might have one of three other uh, positions there. And this one, and we can try them out. So we, 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 we create, we print three keys. And we can uh, just um, alter one of the pin stack uh, positions. 
So we keep three positions the same, and the other one we can vary. And we make three keys, and we test them all, and maybe none of them work. That gives us information. And for the third key, there's two more possibilities. And we print them, and we try them out, and maybe only one works. And for the last one, we print three, and also maybe one works. And naively speaking, we would say, well, uh, it must be the highest positions for, every, um, for everyone that must be the master key. And we can print that, and hopefully that will open all of the locks. Mm, it is actually not true. Oh, yeah, we can copy these. But you can make uh, these key keys, try them out, and get information about what works. But what's interesting is that we do not have just the pins. We also have the magnets, and that makes this lock much more interesting. And in the magnets, we can also do master keying. Because the magnets, here you see the, the bottom of the, uh, sorry, the, the sliders. The bottom of the slider, you see there's place for two magnets. Also in the key, we have place for two magnets. And this we can use for master keying. So we can have a key with a magnet on the left side and another key with a magnet on the right side. And the slider has magnets on both sides. And that's really cool uh, in this lock. Here's a key. This is a key that's part of a master key system. This is a user key. If I have this key, I can read out the magnets. And I already know, using my little device here, uh, it will tell me what magnets are in the cylinder. So, but uh, when I, uh, let's go again. So I know at least these are in the cylinder. And, but what is in the master key? Well, what I can do is I can also read out the magnets in the cylinder in my door. And maybe I will find, find some extra magnets that are in the cylinder, but they do not match anything in my key. Now, so that gives information. So first of all, I know that the master key the master key operates on my door. So it must have the magnets to operate, it must have magnets to operate each slider. Now there are two sliders, the middle ones, that only have one magnet. So I know that the corresponding magnet must be in the master key. So that is something I know for sure. Now there are also magnets that are in the master key that I did not find corresponding magnets in my key. But there are in the master, in the, in the oh, I said master key, right? I, I, the, the magnets I found in the cylinder that are not matched on the key, but they must be in the cylinder for a reason. Um, I mean, you could frustrate hackers and put in magnets that do not do anything, but I'm pretty sure that's not the case. So these magnets are there. They are operated by some other key other than my key. So that must be the master key. So the master key must have magnets that operate on the blue uh, um, magnets in the cylinder. What to do with these sliders that have two magnets? So I still have the, the north uh, up here, and I have the south up there. Uh, should we put the corresponding magnets uh, on the master key or not? Well, I can give you um, an example that shows you that you should not. So let's suppose that, so this is the key we just saw. And this is my cylinder. But we all, in this master key system, we also have a different cylinder, cylinder B, with its own key, key B. And if you look closely, you will see that key A does not open cylinder B, and key B does not open cylinder A. Because here is a south matching the north-south, and here is a north uh, matching the south-north. So they cannot be mixed. If the master key would have a, a north-south there, or a south-north, it would not, not open uh, one of the keys. So if we go to cylinder B, read out the magnets in the key, we find out that on the bottom left there is a north, we know that in the master key there should be no magnet. That's something we learn. And we also learn by reading out the second cylinder that it has a magnet that we had not seen before. There is a, uh, on, the, on the second uh, slider, there's a north on the right. And again, this slider only has one magnet, so the master key must operate that one magnet. So in the key, there must be the corresponding magnet, south-north. 
En voor de one on the top, uh, top left in de master key, we are not sure yet. We do not have enough information. It could be that there is no magnet in the master key, or it could be that there is one, but if there is one, it must be a north-south one to operate on these two cylinders. So this is a process of um, looking at keys, measuring the magnets, measuring the magnets in the cylinder, going to a different cylinder, measuring the cylinder to a different cylinder, and each time you see something that you hadn't seen before, you get more information to paint a complete picture of what the master key will look like as far as the magnets go. And the last one, the last magnet, well, we didn't see any magnets, neither in the key or in the cylinder, so we just don't know yet. But you could make a key uh, with these magnets and, and see if, the, if it works as a master key. And um, if it doesn't work, you need to read out more cylinders. So getting a master key, um, well, the, what I said before about filing away, uh, that was a bit naive. Also in the, in the Anker system, because you have both pins and magnets, that means that if you have a key that, is, that could be filed to the master key bidding, that's not an issue if the magnets are different. Because if you are an end user and you file away, well, you, have, you do not have the, the capabilities to exchange the magnets. Well, at least I don't, I don't have the, the CNC uh, stuff. Um, so if you take your key to another lock and you, you, you wonder if it's the master key and it doesn't work, well, that's a bit of an issue. You can read out the magnets in the cylinder to figure out what the correct magnets are, but you cannot figure out what the correct bitting is. So what do you need to do? What you can do is to um, check all other possible uh, bittings uh, in the uh, original uh, lock. So you have the first lock with your own key. And for each pin, you try the other three possibilities, and that will give you information about all the possibilities that are present in the master key for the bidding. Um, and then you can make a whole lot of keys, but not 256, but at most 80, depending on the master key system, and try them out and try which fits in the second lock. So it's interesting. Um, the more cylinders you see and the more cylinders you uh, measure, um, the better you are able to get the, uh, the master key, or as I call it, god mode, the key to all. Um, but it's surprisingly hard. Just, uh, and the reason is this combination of the pins and the magnets. So I'm actually quite impressed with this system that is already 40 years old, and it still so has such a resistance against um, finding out the master key. It certainly is a lot harder than with regular pin terminal locks only. So let's summarize. I may even have time for a few questions, I see, which is great. So summarizing here for the people who are more visually. Um, if you start, if you have a key, if you don't have a key, no, let's start, yeah, let's start with not having a key. You don't have a key, then you can decode at least the magnets in the cylinder, so you know with which magnets are in the key. Then for the pins, well, either you can uh, pick, but that's very hard, that's why it's in light blue. I don't think that's really a, a realistic way of doing it. Um, you could bump. I think bumping is quite realistic, but then you have a one-time opening. If you are able to do impressioning, which is also very, very hard, you could get a working key. So getting a working key without having one at start is very hard. But opening once is, for a very determined ha hacker, doable. If you already have a key, an end user key, a user key, then you can decode the cylinder and the key, gives you more information, you can duplicate the key, and if it is master keyed, you can try with uh, creating a lot of other, well, with the 12 uh, keys, find the other bittings, and then you can go to other uh, cylinders, read them out, and uh, maybe you need to print quite a lot of keys, but if you are persistent, you will be able to, in the end, find the master key, but that is still quite hard. Now, there's one thing I didn't really discuss, which is that if you have opened the cylinder once, um, what you could also do is uh, open the cylinder um, and look at what's inside. So you don't have to make all the setup keys, but you just open it up, look at the pins and the depth, and you can maybe reassemble it or throw it away. But this is also quite hard. Um, if you have a cylinder like this, uh, well, at least I'm not able to, to disassemble this 
but I'm able to disassemble it, but I'm not able to then reassemble it. If it would be a half cylinder, that is doable. Uh, still quite, quite hard. So that's actually where I am with the uh, investigation. It took me quite a lot of time. I, I did have a, a bit of a wish list, wish list, but I didn't have time enough to implement this before MCH. Um, so I wanted to build uh, an um, Arduino shield where you have 16 hole sensors, so you can put on a key and get a reading immediately for the complete key. But obviously, it doesn't really add to what I've been saying, but it, yeah, it's just a nice project to, to, to do another PCB and some electronic stuff. And what also would be really nice is to make a device that will, would read out all the magnets from a cylinder in one go. And I did later find out that there are uh, devices, that uh, magnetometers, that are suitable for that. Um, but uh, yeah, this is uh, harder to solder, and uh, I didn't really uh, pursue this uh, yet. So the conclusion, with the advent of 3D printers, copying keys has become much more easy. For regular standard keys, it's become super easy. And um, yeah, if you show your key to somebody and it's a regular key, somebody can just make a picture of it and make a copy and 3D print it. With these, it's still a bit more complicated with these keys, because if you have a picture, you could see the bitting, but you can't see the magnets. But of course, if you have the, the bitting, you can go to the cylinder, it should, the, the key fits in and read out the magnets, and then you have everything as well. So you should still always um, um, keep your keys in your pocket, or at least non-visible to others. But the attacks are also, in this law, quite difficult, because there is such a constrained space Finding the Grandmaster key, I thought it, was, it would be quite easy, but in the end it is quite complicated, uh, much more than with conventional locks. Um, and please do not test stuff on cylinders that, you, that are not yours or that you do not use. And in the end I would really uh, spend, like to spend a minute on uh, uh, Guido, who has helped me out quite a lot, a colleague of mine, but also Ankerslot. So in the process of responsible disclosure, I talked to Ankerslot a while ago, saying that I was going to do a presentation, and I wanted to hear their thoughts about it, and they were really super about it. So the lead developer invited me to the factory in Enschede. He showed me around, he talked about this, he knew about these things, um, and he was really a great sports about it. So I would like to, if he's watching, I would like to thank him very much. Um, and in the end, I would like to thank you for spending your time to being here with me tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. We've probably got time for maybe one or two questions, um, if anyone's got any. Oh, well, I've got one quickly. Could you, could you have used electromagnets um, instead of putting magnets in? Uh, I, I, I have contemplated electromagnets, but it was too much of a hassle to, find, to make or find electromagnets and do it. And yeah, it, it would be very interesting because you could make a sort of setup key and maybe uh, flip through all the possibilities and do a brute force attack or just click and you have the key. Um, but it would be just too hard for this project to actually make. Uh, I'm already very happy with the result I have so far. I spent a uh, lot of time in, on it and I learned a bunch of stuff about a lot of things. And, uh, that's where it ends for me now. Okay. Oh, super, thanks. Do, does anyone else have any other questions? Oh, we've got one here. We... Since you've talked to uh, Anchor as an ethical hacker, is there a, uh, a recommendation you have for, for them to improve their locks so it's even harder to pick? Well, they're already, I would say, pick-proof. I mean, for uh, for... For a company that buys a lock that, that, that wants to deter uh, burglars, this is secure enough, this is fine. Um, and they're still selling these uh, cylinders, and they sell quite well, I believe. But of course, they're also working on new ideas. So I talked to the developer, they also put magnets in their uh, standard line, they have an infinity line that also has a magnet, and they're also making some, they are actually making some improvements to this uh, specific cylinder. So yeah, there's still a bit of development going on there. Um, but otherwise, yeah, I think this, and you should also not change too much on the design to prevent introducing other flaws. So maybe they, they will come up with a completely new design. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much indeed for explaining that to us. It's fascinating to listen to. So.